cogent advice and inspiration from real self-made millionaires. Welcome to The Eventual Millionaire with your host, Jamie Masters. Welcome to Eventual Millionaire. I am Jamie Masters, and today on the show, we have my very good friend who I talk to every single week on our mastermind, Todd Tresseter. You can find him at financialmentor.com, and he has a brand new book, just came out, called The Leverage Equation. You can get it at financialmentor.com slash leverage book. So go check that out. Thanks so much for coming on the show today, Todd. Thank you, Jamie. So you're the guy in the mastermind that is always paying attention to the numbers, right? We've had you on the show so many times before. Risk, reward, we we go to you for all of this. So explain to me why you even wrote a book called The, the Leverage Equation. All right. So let's backtrack a little bit. Okay. Most people think in terms of like when they think of financial planning, everybody has in their head, the traditional financial model, right? So you go to school, you get a job, you try to sit, you, you pay your bills and you hopefully save a little money with what's left, if anything, and then you try to build wealth. And that's the traditional financial planning model and it works, right? I mean, you can get basic wealth, you can get basic financial comfort, uh, through that model. And after a lifetime, you might get a little bit of financial independence in old age, right? And so that's how it works. It's fine. It's not broken. It's not wrong. However, for people that want a little bit more, and I think that's most of your audience since they're eventual millionaires, um, there's a different model. I call it the advanced planning framework. And the advanced planning framework, we're going to get a little mathematical here. You already keyed up, right? You told you told everybody that's the way I see had stuff. To, had I'm to an prep anal- everyone. Yes. Ready yeah, to go. I'm an analytical guy. <laughs> There's a concept called mathematical expectancy, and it sounds really elaborate and really sophisticated, super simple and intuitive to understand, okay? Uh, everybody gets probability, right? The odds of something happening. A coin flip is 50-50 probability, right? Um, so everybody gets that. What people don't understand is that wealth compounds through expectancy, not probability, And so the difference with expectancy versus probability is it's probability times payoff, right? So what that means in reality, like in practical terms, is outsized payoffs, both negative and positive, have undue effects on your wealth growth, right? So let's take your category here, you know, because you're teaching entrepreneurs how to become wealthy, right? Mm -hmm. And so the beautiful thing about business, what I do is I teach everybody that there's a, in every asset class, there's specific characteristics that you want to harness for building your wealth, right? Because each asset class has unique characteristics. And so staying with business here is your example. First of all, there's three asset classes, right? Business entrepreneurship, business entrepreneurship, real estate, and then what I call paper assets, which is the stocks, bonds, and mutual funds your advisor will sell you. Okay, so there's three asset classes. Most people only think in terms of one. They think in terms of what the financial advisor will sell you. No secret, right? And so, but the business asset class actually has a really unique characteristic, and that's that you can manage the risk very tightly And if you manage the risk very tightly in development and you understand how wealth grows, which is its probability times payoff, then you learn that what you can do is you can fail 99 times out of 100 in business and still have all the wealth you ever need because you only have to be right once. And if you leverage up that one right play, if you play that right, you can have all the wealth you'll ever need. So no other asset class is that true. And that's because the business asset class, you're not connected to your return on equity equation. Now, all these things are kind of coming around the edge of why I wrote this book, okay? This book, The Leverage Equation, talks about the leverage portion of the advanced planning model, okay? So I teach the advanced planning model as well as the traditional model. I teach them both in a wealth planning class that I have. We can talk about that later if you want. And so I teach both models. It's not right or wrong. You can blend them both in, in your own wealth plan. But the thing about it is the, the leverage equation releases you from so many limitations in financial planning that you're bound by in the traditional model. And so that's, that's why it's written, is just to introduce the advanced planning framework. And the way all this connects is coming back to this mathematical expectancy equation, right? Your wealth is growing by probability times payoff. Leverage is how you tilt the payoff equation favorably. Risk management is the flip side of that. Risk management is how you control the loss side of the payoff equation, right? So when you work carefully with risk management to control risk, and then you leverage up using the leverage equation when you get things right, then what happens is you dramatically tilt the payoff equation, you get large gains, you get tiny losses, and then you multiply your wealth dramatically. 
So that's where leverage equation fits into the context of the whole wealth building puzzle. Okay. So does I that have, make sense? it does, but I want you to make, break it down because I've seen you do this to our mastermind participants and they have these huge aha moments because it's in reality. Cause talking about the theory side of how this works, everyone's like, okay, give me an example. So do you have an example? <laughs> because it makes so much more logical sense when you just sort of pull it out together with an example. Okay. Well, let's just grab our businesses. Okay. okay. We've got online businesses. Um, we could sit here and, um, well, it's traffic times conversion, right? Mm -hmm. Our, the, our business model is traffic times conversion equals profit. And so you can multiple, I'm doing a lousy job of coming up with an example. Off the top <laughs> of this. Do we I, edit here? <laughs> <laughs> no, we never edit. We love seeing this. Um, I've, I've seen, um, someone do, um, uh, the expectancy model when it comes to like buying used versus buying new too. And I'm just trying to think of if there's any way that we can do like a calculation. Cause I understand it, but I'm just wanting to make sure everybody else understands what the, especially the expectancy of loss that you're really good at talking about. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the things that's unusual about how I teach stuff is I always focus on risk first, controlling risk first. I always figure out how to control losses. Um, and again, that's very counterintuitive. Most people, when they think about wealth building, they're always thinking in terms of the gain. Um, the flip side is I never do a business model that's not scalable, right? Because that's how you get large gains is you, you first, the way you play this game is when you understand leverage, you understand risk management, you understand these ideas, what you want to do first with a business model. So this might be helpful is you bootstrap first. Okay. Okay. To get to profitability, there's always two stages to ramping up a business model to build wealth. The first one is first you bootstrap to get to profitability, to prove out the model, to find all the flaws in the model, to eliminate the risk or reduce the risk. Mm. Once you prove out the model and get it right, then you leverage it up. Then you ramp it up. You scale. And so there's a couple ideas in here that are key. One of them is don't do a business model that won't scale, right? <laughs> okay. If it's not going to scale, you can never play for what the big win. What does that mean though? Like what? Because some people are like, oh, $100,000. Like what does scale mean? Okay. Well, both you and I are coaches. Mm -hmm. Okay. Coaches don't scale. <laughs> right? That's a service business, yep. right? So yep. it has a valid use in our business models, right? It allows us to connect with our clients, understand their problems. It's basically revenue producing market research. Okay. So yep. it has a proper role within our business models, but it'll never be much of a business, right? Because it's trading time for money. Whereas products, you and I both have products. Okay. Those are scalable. We both have teams. Teams bring in time leverage mm. that scales as well. We use business systems, right? So we have online marketing systems through content marketing. We have uh, conversion systems through funnels on the website. Um, um, you know, all that stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. is that making sense? Oh, totally. Well, that's the thing. So as somebody starting a business, like you don't get into a whole bunch of debt before you start a business because you haven't even proven the model. So you're saying prove the model first, which is great. And then leverage as much as we possibly can to make sure that it can scale later. Cause there's no point in starting something when you're like, I can only cap out at a hundred grand because then I'll have to go back to the regular way we build wealth, which is sad. Right. Yeah. Correct. <laughs> okay. So like, if you look at my life history, I've <laughs> You know, I've always done stuff kind of unconventionally, but there was always a reason for it is that I was pursuing scalable models. So like when I came out of college and I was interested in, in investing and finance and all that, mm -hmm. 99 kids out of 100 would have gone in, become a financial advisor or stockbroker, right? I went into the hedge fund industry. Like it, did, it wasn't even a name back then. You know, it was skill-based investment management. The word hedge fund didn't even exist back then, really? right? We were private. Yeah, we were private placement partnerships. It was before it was a sexy thing, yeah. right? And then you can look at, okay, so Todd sells the hedge fund and then I go into real estate, but I didn't just go buy single family homes. I went and bought large apartment buildings. I started, my first purchase was a 60 unit apartment building. My second purchase was a 101 unit apartment building. I'd never even <laughs> bought a single family home except for my own living. Do you recommend people do that though? Because that seems like a very steep learning curve. It, well, it was a steep learning curve, right? It's scary. It's like I always tell people that first purchase, it was like uh, you go to you go to a, a bridge and you attach the bungee cord and you jump off. Like, I right? hope this works. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> that, that doesn't it, sound like you're proving your model kind of thing, like you're talking risk. Well, it, but it is. <laughs> okay. It, actually, it is. It okay. totally fits the model because it was very risk managed. Excuse me, I'm going to cough. It was very risk managed because um, – hold on. Back then, what you could do is um, they had uh, conduit loans. 
And so I could buy a, um, a large apartment building for less risk than buying a single family home because they had no recourse to my personal assets, <laughs> right? So all they could do is have recourse to the building itself. And so the only risk I had was the down payment on the property. And then I could even bring in investors to do the down payment on the property. So, I mean, I could control it. I can control a hundred units for less risk than a house. See, this is why I like the way you think, Todd, <laughs> because it's because so, it's less about the the jumping off the biggest bridge you can find and being like, let's test this out. It's like, no, I did all my due diligence and checked everything to make sure before I jumped off like that. Oh, right? yeah, yeah. I mean, it's still scary, right? I'm, I'm not going to, you know, say it's not scary. It was tremendously scary. But I, I had figured it out that it was less risk to do and it was a more controlled risk to my personal net worth than buying single family homes. So let me let me bring up a scenario. Maybe you can give some because uh, one of the things that you talked about, which I loved um, in the mastermind, was about taking loans or not taking loans. And I know when somebody's building, let's say they're not in the first stage, so they've proven out their business model, but they're maybe only making two hundred grand a year ish, right? And they're like, oh, it's as soon as this happens, we can hire that right team member, but it feels like it's taking too long, right? And if that's the case. Should they invest? Should they ever get a loan? Should they not? I feel like this is what um, everybody asks about. Like, is it a big deal? Should we invest if we know that it's a scalable model to try and achieve the goal, or do we not? And we try and bootstrap the whole way through. Yeah, you only you only take this is called financial leverage, right? So six types of leverage, and the one you're referring to, which is the most common, the one people intuitively get, is financial leverage. Now, the unique aspect of financial leverage is it cuts both ways. It's the only form of leverage that cuts both ways. It increases your risk just as much as it increases your potential reward, hmm. right? All the other five types of leverage do not do that. The other five types of leverage, you can increase reward while reducing risk. Okay. okay? Tell me more well, about those stay, after. Yeah. Well, okay. let, yeah, let's stay with financial okay. leverage first. So the answer to your question is you would take on financial leverage when the return on the investment exceeds the cost of the leverage, Okay. right? So in other words, let's say you use that money to buy business assets, and those business assets generate more than the, the cost of the loan. So that means it's a self-liquidating loan. In other words, the business asset produces the revenue to liquidate the loan, and you've got the return on the asset on top of that. So the answer would be yes in that situation. So it's situational. You have to understand what the return on that investment will be, and it has to exceed the cost of the capital. You know, it's the same thing with employees, right? You take on employees, but only if the return on the employee exceeds the cost of that employee. I love that you brought up employee. How does somebody calculate that though? Because I think what's interesting, everyone's like, well, I if I have three months of a salary, does that mean that it's good enough? And then by the time they hit the three month mark, hopefully they'll be making me more money. It, of course, depends on the role and all sorts of other things. But when, but we get asked that question a lot, when is the right time? So give us the equations that we I need to be I look running. At, I look at the business model before and after okay. the increased cost, right? Okay. So like, you know, you and I both have assistants. Mm -hmm. Right. So I look at what I can create and what the business model can become with an assistant versus what I can create and what the business model will become without the assistant. OK. And so I can focus. The assistant basically allows me to build the products and build the scalable model. Without an assistant, I get stuck in the drudgery. I get stuck in all the detail. And frankly, my assistant's way better at all that stuff than I am. OK. So the one thing I'm irreplaceable on is the development of the information products. So the books and the courses, nobody else can do those except for Todd because they're all inside my head, right? And I've got them in files and drawers and everything's mapped out. I have to give them product form. That's the one thing I'm irreplaceable on. You wanna leverage out everything else that you're replaceable on so you can focus on the high value activities that only you can do. So why haven't you hired like a SEO person or a digital marketer or something besides that because it seems like technically in that scenario you can go well with that digital marketer that could go crazy my business could be doing more I could hire five more new people right does that make sense how how would well, you know actually, where to stop actually to be correct as you well know I did try hiring and they didn't do it as well as me and they screwed up the business okay so, exactly. so, I, so how do we what what is the risk easy. reward in that <laughs> okay that's not easy I like to quote Steve Jobs on this right mm -hmm. about bozos you know, you bring in bozos into your business. Um, I've actually got a quote in the book and I'm not, I'm going to butcher it, but it's something like, you know, A players bring in A players, B players bring in C players, C players bring in D players, D players bring in F players. And before you know it, you got bozo explosion, <laughs> right? And so 
you have to really cut off quick when you're working with a team and building a team that you have nothing but A players, okay? My assistant and my technology guy, they are A players. They are brilliant. They're great at what they do. They're smart. They work on their own. I, I, I mean, I'm just so fortunate to have them, right? My designer, brilliant, okay? I brought an SEO guy. He was a D player. I fired him quick. Yep. Okay. He did a lot of damage fairly quick. It took a while for the A team to go back and clean it all up. What happens is when you, excuse me, I'm going to cough. Mm -hmm. When you have a D player, then what happens is it pulls the whole team down. Everybody is dragged down by the D player. Nobody wants to, no A players want to play with D players. And so if you want to have an A team, you cut your D players quick, cut your B players quick. You have to, be, you, and so it's just, it's the nature of it. And you can't turn a D player into an A player. Oh, it's, totally. it's just too hard. Yep. You know, you're far better off going back and finding somebody that's, that has that natural bent. And you know, as well as I do, the skills that make an A player are not necessary. Most of the skills are trainable. Mm -hmm. It's the beingness. It's the person that isn't trainable. Right. Totally. So we, so then why, yeah, so that's where the risk reward thing comes back in, right? Because while that hire sucked for you. Of course, you did the best you can. You thought you were hiring an A player. That's what everybody does when they hire. They're like, this guy's going to be great. That's what we hope. Yeah. Otherwise, we wouldn't hire them. Right. But on the loss side, are, are, why didn't you try and find another one again? Because we, then we start getting gun shy. So I feel like our emotions play into this equation. So why haven't you tried to hire that again, even though technically the risk reward might be good? It always takes time to bring the team up to speed. And so I have to prioritize my time. I have to prioritize what I'm focused on at the time. And so right now, that piece of the business is not the same priority as the other pieces of the businesses that I'm focusing on. And Even so if the risk reward can still be high. So there could be a lot of different choices you can make where the risk reward with the leverage equation works really, really well, but you just have to prioritize when you do what. Yeah. Ultimately, as I teach in the book, your ultimate limited resource is time, mm. right? And the older you get, the more that becomes prevalent, right? Jamie, see, I got the gray hair here. <laughs> and so and so, time is your limiting resource, and that's why leverage is so quick because what is so important is because through leverage, you can accelerate all the wealth growth equations, and through financial wealth, you can buy back time. You can't buy more time, but you can buy, from, you can buy your time from the things that you don't want to do so you can focus on things you do want to do. And so... That's why leverage is so important. It's, an, it's two things. What, there's a couple of big principles I teach in the leverage equation that are very unconventional. The first is people understand you can use leverage principles, and there's six of them. We should get to them before yes. we cut off yes. here. Um, you can use leverage principles to accelerate your wealth growth. That part's intuitive. People get that, right? Um, the thing they don't understand, and this is tremendously important for your entrepreneurs listening, is you use leverage to break through the obstacles that hold you back from greater success. Mm. So I know you're going to want an example. We got to bring this down and you already <laughs> got me off guard. So I'm going to turn it back to you okay. and I'm going to say, give me an obstacle in your business right now that's holding you back from greater success. And we'll see that it's actually this, the solution is leverage. So go ahead. I need, you mean as far as like needing another team member or something like that? Because I need okay. another team member. All right. So that would be time leverage, right? Okay. Or possibly you might be able to streamline the business better through technology and systems leverage so your existing team can run everything. Okay. Okay. I'm an automation so queen, so that might not be correct. But yes, that's I get true. it. <laughs> both, both you and I are kind of systems junkies, yeah. right? So that's probably not our weak point. That's probably our strength. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so you'd probably be through time leverage with another team member. And so that's an example, okay. right? Yep. Um, I ran into what I thought were SEO obstacles in my business. And so I hired a team member, an SEO expert. That would be two different forms of leverage. It's time leverage, but it's also knowledge and experience leverage. Ooh, okay. Okay. Knowledge and experience leverage. So I'm giving you, so let's go through yeah, them all real quick through. just so you get the list. Yep. So the first one's financial leverage, right? Other people's money. So you're not limited to your own, mm -hmm. right? Time leverage, other people's time. So you're not limited to your own technology and systems leverage, uh, communications and marketing leverage, hmm. network and relationship leverage, which you are the genius on and I am weak at <laughs> <laughs> and knowledge and experience leverage. Okay, okay, so nice. those are the six types of leverage. And through those six types of leverage, you can use them to break through any obstacle that holds you back in business. And so the way I teach this is you actually want to identify the things that are holding you back 
and then match it to the type of leverage and then find the solution. So the solution to business growth always exists within leverage. That's why it's the leverage equation. That makes so much sense. So why, so financial though, you were saying sort of, we can be riskier, right? But most of these aren't. Why are most of these not? Quote well, let's look at it. So let's say that we bring in a marketing funnel. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a marketing funnel for technology and systems leverage. It's also a form of communications and marketing leverage. Mm -hmm. That's another principle that I teach in the book is that these forms of leverage, we use them to break it up, right? So intellectually, we can have categories. But what you find is when you put into practice, it actually crosses over, right? Things cross categories a lot. So let's say we bring in a marketing funnel, right, to mm -hmm. solve the fact that we're not converting well, mm -hmm. okay? So that's going to bring in knowledge leverage for people that are good at building knowledge for people that are skilled at building marketing funnels. You need the technology or systems to operate the marketing funnel, right? And the marketing funnel itself is a form of communications or marketing leverage, okay? So you're bringing, it's like three forms of leverage here that are being applied and you're using the different tools in different ways to solve a basic problem, which is you've got a conversion problem in your business. Okay. okay? Then how do we determine whether or not we spend 20 grand on a new marketing funnel do you know what I mean? Because it could also go wrong, like we were saying. Because I've spent right. a lot of money so, on marketing funnels that have not done as well as I wanted to do. <laughs> right. So you have to decide. There's different ways of do, so going into knowledge leverage. You can go for making the knowledge tacit within yourself, right? So you take tacit knowledge and you make it um, known within yourself. So you could learn the marketing funnels rather than hire it out. Yep. You could start learning about marketing funnels and you could learn about copywriting so that you can manage the cost structure of marketing funnels in your business more effectively, right? Mm -hmm. Or you can just turn around and delegate it, time leverage, straight up to other experts who have that knowledge. But the problem is a lot of times they're not that good with your business. They're an expert at writing marketing funnels, but they don't get your brand, your marketing message. Maybe they don't understand your target market. They don't know how to position the product. There's a lot of skills involved. And so that's one of the things about the entrepreneur is you've got to have sufficient skill to wear a lot of hats so that you're a good delegator. So one of my rules is I always do it first and then I delegate second. And that way I have the skill and the knowledge to delegate effectively. See, I know you really go into that a lot where I'm like, Todd, just hire a Facebook or just hire this person. And you're like, I'm going to learn it first. But it sounds like time uh, as far as what, what you actually want to be spending your time on, that's part of it. Like you know that the risk of potentially hiring someone wrong will waste more time. So you might as well learn on the front, on the front end yourself. So that way you can delegate it, right? And there's an integration process. Like I just had a conversation with my tech guy last night, which was kind of interesting in that you know, he knows his little piece of the business. Mm. My assistant knows what she's doing. Totally. This person over here that I hired knows their little piece of business, but somebody has got to stand in the middle and glue it all together. And I'm shocked at how much expertise it takes to do this because ultimately I'm selling my financial expertise, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what I brought to the equation. But in order to build this business, I've had to develop technology expertise. I've had to develop funnel marketing communications, writing techniques, I mean, all these different skills have been, have to stand somewhere in the middle to glue it all together to manage the team effectively. And the buck stops with you. And so there is ultimately a bit of knowledge required to apply the leverage properly and cost efficiently. Well, and that's the pain in the butt of the owner because the owner then goes, now I know all the pieces of all the little things and then they they don't delegate well, or they're trying to do too much, right? Oh, no, 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 no. See, that's where you have to draw the line. You cannot, I mean, Chris Ducker did a great job with that in his book. You cannot be the superhero, right? He calls it the superhero syndrome. And I thought that was a brilliant name, right? Where you start thinking you can do it better than everybody else. Uh-uh, no, no. You have to learn enough to delegate effectively. You don't have to learn enough to be the expert in everything, hmm. okay? So like, I know enough about technology and the systems that operate the business that I'm very good at managing and delegating. And I know when people are wrong and I know when people are right because I'm deep enough into it. But my technology guy has forgotten more than I'll ever learn. Okay. I mean, yep. he lives and breathes it every day. He can do in five minutes what it would take me a day to struggle with. Right. I mean, he's brilliant at it. Same thing with my assistant. My assistant is so much better at all the details and all the work. She knows my website and my content better than I do. And I wrote it. I'm, I'm not kidding you. I mean, she remembers stuff on there that I don't know, right? Because I've covered too much ground, whereas she's just, she's on top of it. And so I'm really good at, I have enough background knowledge in all the different pieces 
to manage it effectively. But each expert that I delegate to knows way more about it than I do. And so you can always find people that are better than you. Do not ever believe that you're better than, than, you know, the other people. Uh, uh, uh. Seriously, your life will be so much better if you can actually learn to trust other people and how good they are yeah. with things, right? Well, what happens, like I taught this in finance, right? You have to develop enough knowledge to know people that are yes. full of horse pucky. <laughs> I, we're not allowed to swear here, yes. right? Definitely. You have to, I mean, like one of the things that I teach in, in uh, when I teach investment strategy, right, is you have to know enough to know that this manager, this money manager that you're doing due diligence on is simply wrong. Yeah. Okay. Or he's looking at things wrong and there's a specific structure you have to follow. See? And so when I teach people this stuff, their, their eyes wide open. They're like, oh my gosh, I had never understood it that way. And once they understand it that way, not much gets by you. See, and that to me is that risk uh, equation piece that you can sort of mitigate at least a little bit, like having a, a background in technology. I can go to my clients and be like, that guy has no idea what he's talking about. This guy, don't do not hire them. They will suck really bad. Right. Yeah. But because you have that, um, that headset. So when, but when you're looking but at, let's, but let's look at yeah. something, stay mm -hmm. with your example, okay. your technology background was from an academic thing and it was from a while ago. So you know, enough to delegate, you know, enough to find the flaws but the guys you hire are way better at it than you. Yes, I'm really, I'm like, I'm not figuring this out. Somebody else has to do this. I know I could, I don't want to, <laughs> right? Yeah, so like right now, I'm learning Facebook marketing, mm. but I'm never going to be John Loomer, right? I'm never going to be an expert who practices it every day because I'm not going to do that with my time. But I have to know enough to know how these puzzle pieces fit together because I have to run all the conversion funnels on the other side that they're running the traffic through. And I have to know how to analyze that data and how to put all the puzzle pieces together. I guess so how I have much to know enough like, is enough though, because you could go down the Facebook marketing crazy thing, right? And understand, and, and don't get me wrong, there's a lot of basic stuff, but how deep do you go in that learning before you delegate? That's something you learn with practice, okay? I have to know enough to make a decision. That's something that um, is a little bit unusual about me. You've worked with me enough yeah. on this to know is you have to know you have to know how to go far enough with the knowledge and then you have to know to cut it off and make your decisions right like an analytical type like me often they get lost in you know details and analyzing and analyzing and i've always been unusual because i can just look at something and snap a decision which is unusual for an analytical type and that's because you have to be clear what are the critical factors to each decision but when you get you have clear this background info, it makes it way easier for you to make that decision because you can run calculations that will help you make the decisions anyway right yeah, bingo. So you have to have, you have to be clear what are the critical factors to success in each decision. Once you understand the critical factors and you get to that point, stop and delegate. Okay. But there's a million things in business, right? There's a million choices. There's a million everything. And that's the thing that yeah. gets annoying. So how do we organize, especially with what you've told us so far, how do we organize what goes where? How do we prioritize any of this stuff? Because a business probably needs a hundred different things at one time. Right. So identify the most prevalent obstacle in front of you today. Start with that, find the leverage piece that, find the leverage type that will solve it, identify the leverage solution, leverage it out, go to the next obstacle, go to the next obstacle. In other words, the most prevalent obstacle will be the one you identify. Mm -hmm. So you have to look at the whole business system that you're building and look at the critical factors that are failing or limiting you. You know, that's like when I just asked you, I said, so what's, what's the prevalent obstacle in front of you in your business, yeah. right? So then I would look at what's the prevalent obstacle in front of mine, which was products, right? You know that from working with me, I was really good at building traffic. I got very good at SEO, very good at content marketing, ramped up the traffic on my website and went, what a fool I am, right? I had no products to sell. I had no way to convert it. <laughs> People love right? me. Yay. Yeah. What, what? <laughs> It's a cute hobby, yep. right? But yep. it wasn't much of a business that way. And so then I focused on product creation, right? Yeah. And so I've been ignoring the traffic growth for quite a while. And I've been working on the product side of the business, developing the entire product line. And then I'll go back and build the traffic. See, you so have patience that, though. Like that's the thing that I find very, very – so what I loved at the beginning that you said is that you can get it wrong 99% of the time. And that's – like a lot of people have had an obstacle, right? I mean I'm a coach. You're a coach. People have an obstacle, whether – it be an obstacle also in their brain and in their business, right? That they try and solve. And then if that doesn't work, then they try and solve it. And if that doesn't work, they don't feel like they're making any progress. And then everything else goes to crap. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So like, so how many times do they keep trying to fix that same problem and focus on it? Cause you got, you have this patience that you're like, I'm just going to build products for a year. 
I'm like, a whole year. That's the only thing you're focusing on. Like, that's I, very I, impressive. I wish it was only a year. It's been <laughs> right? a lot it's longer been, than that. It's been years, yeah. But, th- but I guess that's my point. Like, for other people, they, <laughs> I don't know, maybe our patience is a lot less than yours. But you try and solve a problem, try and solve it, try and solve it, try and solve it. If it took me two, three years to do something, I think I'd die. It would be so annoying to me, right? And so how do you stick with that? Or how do you keep getting it wrong and keep pursuing the biggest obstacle? Um, clarity of thinking people, people will say, Oh, Todd, you're so disciplined, you know, or something like that. It's not, I'm not disciplined. I mean, I'm as lazy as the next guy. Right. And I want to go have fun and I want to go do other, other things. I'm very clear about why I'm building the business, what it's about for me. And I'm very clear about what is the correct business model. So it's like very layered thinking of clarity so that I don't get distracted. I don't get pulled off. Um, by all the bright, shiny objects in the world, right? So I know exactly why I'm building this business, what it means to me. You know, I've committed to it. I'm committing the time to it. I understand exactly how the business model works. I've spent the time learning it. Um, I know how it grows. I know how the different puzzle pieces fit together and how they work. And so I methodically build. You know, I grab this puzzle piece. I grab that one. I do this one. But notice how it all starts from the top. If I wasn't absolutely clear about the business, what I'm building and why I'm building it and what it means to me, it'd be very easy to get distracted. Like if it was all about the money, right? It'd be very easy to get distracted. I should have built a course long ago and I should have used affiliate marketing and I should have leveraged up through network leverage to go find the contacts and build the conversion systems and do webinar marketing and blah, 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 you know, and go on and on and on. That's not why I'm building it. You know, I'm building it to get my message out. I have an, a, an unusual understanding about how wealth building works. It worked for me. It's worked for my coaching clients. And so I'm trying to productize that knowledge. You know, my customers are constantly telling me it's such an unusual perspective on how this is put together. And so this book, Leverage Equation, is connecting out that advanced planning framework. It's taking back to the root. Notice how we even started the conversation. I started with mathematical expectancy. Not a great leader, right? (laughs) It's not, it's not like, oh, I'm just going to hook the crowd with the word mathematical expectancy. It's like <laughs> right? everybody turned, everybody turned off the interview, right? With that <laughs> word math, right? Yeah. But that's the core. That's the foundation on which these principles are built. If you don't understand mathematical expectancy and a probability times payoff and how it affects your wealth, if that's not central to your thinking, mm-hmm. then you're not going to have risk management and leverage as a center to your thinking. You're not going to understand the characteristics of the business asset of the asset classes and how to use them in your wealth plan to compound your wealth, right? So it starts from the ground. It builds up. You have to be very clear in your thinking. So and you, it makes it the, the chaos that is business and entrepreneurship, right? You're like, no, it's methodical. It's this, it's that. And when people are in it, they don't feel that way. And that's why I, I so appreciate your perspective because it always is very grounded in like reality. And you're like, no, the box just needs to move here, by the way, that's it. Mm-hmm. And you're like, oh, so it, it simplifies the whole thing. How does somebody who is not as methodical as you or analytical as you do this if they're not, if it's not something that is innate in them, right? Because if it's chaos normally, ah, right? It's way harder to be like, I'm going to be like Todd and be like, I need 12, a 12 step three year program. And I'm just going to stick with it <laughs> 12, forever. 12 step, like AA, 12 right? step, 11 <laughs> steps. Good. <laughs> Who needs that 12th one? No, but does that make sense? Like, cause you, you run from that world. Like you're really good at that, but there's a lot of entrepreneurs that are literally ADD squirrel and stuff like that. How can they apply it if it doesn't feel like it's innate in them? I don't know. <laughs> um, you get a coach, I yeah. guess. I mean, that was that was one of the things I did back when I was coaching one on one. I mean, I'm not here to pitch it because I'm not coaching one on one anymore. Um, I just don't have the time. But um, you know, that was one of the things I did for my clients is I held I it, it's a corny coaching slogan. I held the space for them, right? In other words, like I understood what they were doing, I learned their model. And so while they were running around like a chicken with their head cut off implementing I was the one that stayed back there and said, okay, what about this? We have to clean up this mess. You've got to get this foundation in place first before you leverage up over here. Otherwise you're going to create a disaster. Right. And so I would understand how the pieces moved and I worked very carefully with each client and it worked. So you could find a coach. So here's, okay. So here's the answer. It's leverage. You asked me a problem. The answer is leverage. If you don't have that skill set, then you leverage it from somebody else. So I used the example of coaching and I stumbled right into it, didn't I? You're going to leverage the background of a coach that has the skill set that you're missing 
to round you out. Mm. Okay. So like I have clients that create 10 times faster than I do. They are brilliant creators. They go so fast. You've had clients like Josh, Mm -hmm. right? I remember talking with Josh. He's an unbelievable creator. Some people are just brilliant at creating, but then they have other weaknesses. Okay. I'm brilliant at figuring it all out. I'm brilliant at like putting all the puzzle pieces together, analyzing it, understanding it. I'm not so good at creating. I'm slow. You've seen it. I'm, I'm too methodical. I take too long. I'm too analytical. I'm too detailed. Everything has to be perfect. You know, know, I'm like, run a beta. He's like, no. (laughs) I'm like, okay, well, it worked. No, that's not how I work. Okay. You know yourself so well though. You know yourself so well, which is very helpful on the rounding out everything else that is not of the the main skill set that you have. Yeah. And so, you know, play to your strengths, leverage out your weaknesses. Again, leverage is always the answer. Sounds corny, right? But it works. It actually works. That's How the way perfect it works. perfect you wrote a book all about this. Because <laughs> it's, it's, it's so misunderstood, Jamie. Everybody thinks it's about financial leverage. They think it's going to be risky. Like you're just leveraging up into some big pie in the sky thing. No, leverage is way more useful than that. It's way more important. That's the message I'm trying to get out. Which I really appreciate because you have so many books in the financial uh, space, which do really, really well. And then you came out with this one. You're like, it's kind of businessy. And I'm like, but you're the financial guy, like your financial mentor.com. That was the whole thing. And I love, cause this is the way your brain thinks. So I love the way that you've presented it all. Cause it makes it seem less chaotic and everyone that's an entrepreneur <laughs> needs a little less chaos in their life. Well, I'm assuming. And there's a reason why that's true, right? Is lever. There's more opportunity for leverage in the business asset class. Remember I was going back, I was saying there's three asset classes in wealth building, right? Which is what I teach. And so there's more opportunity for leverage in the business asset class than there is in paper assets. There's almost no opportunity for leverage in paper assets. That's why it's the slow path to growth. Mm. That's why business is the fast path to growth, right? If you look at the results of how people become wealthy, you'll see it's mostly business, right? There's a reason. And there's a reason for that leverage opportunities. That's why the book is called the leverage equation, right? There's a reason we're featuring business in wealth building. All these things have reasons. The data supports it. Well, it's even, not, I'm just, I'm not conjecturing this stuff, right? It's all built from facts. Well, even doing all the interviews that I've done close to 500 now, it's like business for Now, of course I go after business people for sure, but it's business. And then they take the extra money that they make on that. They put it in real estate and then they put it in investing, right? So there's only so many places that we can move it to or make it from that. It's not actually rocket science. Yeah. And real estate is the second most prevalent form of wealth building right? Second to business entrepreneurship. And it has the second most leverage opportunities. Again, Mm. not a coincidence. Mm, I love this. Okay. So we have to start wrapping up. Where do we get the book first before I ask the last question? At all the major retailers, you know, look up leverage equations, right? So it's at Apple, it's at Amazon, of course, Kobo, Barnes and Noble. Uh, It just went live last night as we record this actually. Um, So it's in all, it's in all the retailers, wherever you prefer to shop, that's where it is. And I told Todd, I bought, I'm like, I bought it. He's like, you didn't have to. I would have said, to, no, buy the book. Gosh, darn people. Okay. It is a book. <laughs> it's amazing. Thank you so much for coming on. The last question is what is one action listeners can take this week to help move them forward towards their goal of a million? Assess how much time you're dedicating in your day to leverage growth opportunities versus how much of your time is either being pissed away or spent trading time for money on unleveraged activities. So literally track your time. You'll be shocked how little of your time goes into leveraged activities. When you do that, you'll understand the importance of this. I'm so excited that you said that. It's funny. I have people do toggle and stuff like that. Someone just sent me one of these weird timer things so I can test it out. So now I... I want to actually time, do what you say and actually time it. Cause I feel like the, the data will help me understand exactly what goes where. And I can make a little thing on it that says leverage. Awesome. So, so when you take that, cause you and I work together through the mastermind yeah. and stuff, right? When yeah. you take that, my, my, some of the stuff I do that sounds so insane will make a lot more sense, right? Because what I'm doing is I'm organizing all my time around highly leveraged activities, yeah. you know? So That's why. And slow and steady wins the race. It's amazing to see your growth over this uh, seven, eight, I don't know how many years we've been doing this. We've been doing the mastermind a ridiculously long period of time. And it's so awesome to see the methodicalness 
and and steadiness to the course and you're like, yep, yeah, it's like this. Yep, yeah, it's like this. There's never have well, chaos in your life. Well, besides the adventure craziness that you do. <laughs> yeah, except, except, for, except for falling off mountain bikes and skiing off cliffs, but that's a different thing. <laughs> Risk management goes out the door there, right? right? In personal life. Um, so the but the, that's part of what I teach. It's not an accident, right? The way I teach it is when you're focused on risk management, your wealth grows like a staircase. It looks like a staircase, right? As you're in stuck areas and you're having problems, it goes flat because you're an expert at risk managing. And then when you get it right and you leverage up and you get the pieces right, you take a stair step up uh -huh. and then it goes flat and you take a stair step up. And in the time we've been together, that's exactly what my business has done, hasn't it? Yep. It goes, it goes flat up. Flat up, flat yep. up, flat up. Yeah. Instead of and going down, which no entrepreneur wants to do. <laughs> and right. that's and that's because of yeah. this combination built on mathematical expectancy. All I'm doing is I'm applying exactly what I'm teaching you, right? It's about how you take mathematical expectancy and you leverage up for the big win and you risk manage for the small loss. So that way you only get small losses and then you get big wins and eventually it comes out well. Genius. Yes. Thank you so much for explaining this to everyone on the show. Everyone go pick up the book. Todd, hopefully I will see you again soon and chat with you again on Monday like we always do for the past seven or eight years. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Jamie. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that interview. And if you want to check out more amazing resources, I'm only curating the best of the best. Go check out eventualmillionaire.com. You can take the eventual millionaire quiz, figure out where you are in business and what you need right now. Plus you can look at curated resources specifically for you on the new start here page. I'm so excited. Please join us. Please let me know if you need anything at all. I'm here for you and have a fantastic day. Bye.